Yanis. Thank you, Tom. Very good to be here. Um, I, let's start there, shall we? What is your wildest prediction for the future? It's not a prediction. It is uh, a diagnosis. My name is Tom Goodwin, and this is my wildest prediction. His name shot to fame in 2015 when he was anointed uh, Minister of Finance in Greece at the height of the European debt crisis. This is Yanis Varoufakis, an author, academic, perhaps activist, a politician. And we're here to discuss the, the future of capitalism and how technology is changing the world. Uh, we're going to talk about his latest book, Techno-Feudalism, The End of Capitalism. This book is not about what will happen in the future. It is a highly controversial notion of what has already gone down. So this, I'm not writing about what AI would do to the labor market, uh, what will happen to us with Big Brother and you know surveillance and any of that. It is my estimation, and this is a controversial hypothesis, that capitalism has already ended, which is um, very strange. Yes. I don't remember this it feeling sounds, like something that happened. Yeah. Uh, you see, but the, the, Tom, the, the way I see it is this. Suppose this was 1776 and we were in uh, London and we were having a discussion about the state of the world. Now, everywhere we looked in 1776, we would see feudalism. We would see feudalism in the House of Lords, in the House of Commons, in government, in every local council around the world, um, on the land. We would see peasants, we would see you know, aristocrats. And yet, we do know that, don't we? Already, feudalism had died and was being gradually but fast being replaced by something called capitalism. The magnificent shift of power from the owners of land to the owners of machinery, of uh, steamships, of electrical grids later on. Hmm? And the shift of wealth creation from rent accumulation to profit making. My view is that we are already experiencing a similar transformation. Wherever we look, we see capital. We see markets. We see capitalists doing extremely well. And yet I think that already we have undergone a transformation to something like feudalism, but a very technologically advanced version of it. Markets have been replaced by platforms. So Amazon.com is not a market. It looks like a market but it's more like a digital fiefdom, a cloud fiefdom, <laughs> belonging to one man whose accumulation of wealth is based not on profit, but on a form of rent. Every time you buy something from Amazon, 30-40% of the price goes to Mr. Bezos, and not to the maker. And how are you sort of defining assets in this world of techno-feudalism? Like, what is it that they are owning? What is it that they are renting? Is it our data, our attention, our no, relationship? No, all that is part of the story, but it's not the story. The story is that a new form of capital began to emerge about 10 years ago. Uh, capital was always a produced means of production. So whether you have Robinson Crusoe's fishing rod, um, a steam engine, or an industrial, a very advanced industrial robot today. It's a produced means of production, something we produced in order to produce other stuff. But this new mutation of capital, which I call cloud capital, mm -hmm. it's what lives in your phone. And Every by time, cloud, you mean it's a sort of ethereal asset? No, you no, mean it's a permission? No, I'm talking about the cloud. Okay. So um, take Alexa or Siri yeah. or Google Assistant, right? Okay. And that sits there or either on your phone or on your desk and you order it to do things. Mm -hmm. Well, yes, but that's only, only a tiny part of the story. Yeah. What it is, it's an interface between you and the whole agglomeration of capital goods, including optic fiber cables that are laid on the ocean floors, mm -hmm. huge, gigantic server farms that hum like a factory, like a dark satanic mill, to quote Edmund Burke, huh? yeah. uh, cell towers, this is capital. Yeah. It doesn't live in the cloud. Yeah. But it's what we call the cloud. Yeah. When you upload stuff, you know, photographs on the cloud, right? Uh, or you save stuff on the cloud. So you interface with this thing, which is a kind of capital, but it's not exactly a produced means of production. Because what, what does Amazon's Alexa, what does it do? Mm -hmm. You're training it, essentially, through your commands, uh, just speaking in the house. You know, it 
gets from you data, mm-hmm. but data on what? On you, on your preferences. Mm-hmm. So you are training it to learn how to give you good recommendations. So I don't know about you, but when Amazon recommends a book, I always want to read it because <laughs> it knows me. When Spotify uh, gives me a recommendation for music, invariably I like it. Mm-hmm. Invariably, because it understands me really very well. So I'm training it to train me, to yeah. train it, to train me, to train it, to train me, so that at some point it can actually make a recommendation and then I can say, okay, I want that. So, and the fundamental thing, Tom, here is that this is not like standard advertising, mm-hmm. where you know you see a poster it says you know, buy a Mercedes Benz, then you go to a Mercedes Benz dealership and you get one. Mm-hmm. No, Alexa convinces you to buy something, an exercise bike, whatever, a pair of binoculars, eh? and then sells it to you, mm-hmm. bypassing every marketplace in the world. Now that is a fiefdom. That is a market, yeah. and you see, and most most income now mm-hmm. that is accumulated is accumulated in the form of rents that Bezos charges Mm -hmm. capitalists for access to this digital Mm system. So we're going back to a system where access to the land, only this time it is digital land, it's what I call cloud capital, Mm -hmm. um, is um, restricted, crucial, outside the marketplace, outside capitalism, and procures a magnificent rent for the new cloud lords. That's a new system. And how are you just sort of defining these new cloud lords? Like, is it a question of the server space that they own? Is it how many customers they have? Like, at, at what point does Walmart become Amazon? At what point does a taxi company become, become Walmart is already Uber. a cloud thief. Okay. Because Walmart, very um, smartly, yeah. has developed its own competitor to Amazon. Mm-hmm. Um, it is using its stores in order to build up its cloud thief. <laughs> and now increasingly the profits, the net returns of Walmart come from the cloud, not from the analog buildings that it still has, mm-hmm. which it uses in order to lure people effectively into the cloud. And you talk about this in a very sort of sinister way almost. I mean, your book is quite gloomy. Um, You know, some people would look at this and they would say they have decided to enter in with a relationship with Amazon. They have decided to upload their pictures to Instagram. They have decided to use WhatsApp as a way to... I don't think my book is at all gloomy. (laughs) I try try to write my book, you know, in a very jovial way. You could argue that people have... I'm writing it, by the way, as a letter to my dad. Yes, yes. So I constantly have a little tiff with my dad (laughs) uh, because I try to imagine what he would have said to me and I try to answer to what I imagine he would have said to me. I think my book is a very pleasant read. It, it didn't feel that way to me, but um, I mean, I'm very optimistic about the future and what technology means, and I think um, I think there's something interesting. But that takes an incredible degree of naivety to be optimistic about the future. Um, I doesn't look, it? Okay. There's no empirical evidence to support that anything good will happen. But where we I would agree with you, evidence that things have got better. Let me see. Let, uh, oh no, 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 we don't. Everything is getting far, far worse for the majority of the people on this earth, including climate catastrophe. Come on, Tom. But if I'll you, tell you, I'll give you this. I'll give you this. And let's see if we can yeah. converge. Yeah, yeah. Um, I'm hopeful. Yeah. I'm not optimistic. Okay. I make it a very great distinction between optimism, which yeah. is the poor cousin of hope, and hope. Hope we need to have. I love those technologies. Don't get me wrong. I'm not a Luddite. I mind you, Luddites are very misunderstood. They didn't like completely, my, yeah, completely misunderstood. Branded. I, I love the Luddites, but well, you know what I mean. I'm not against the machinery. Yeah. Uh, I am absolutely enthusiastic, completely addicted yeah. to all those apps. For instance, I think the world of AI. Yeah. I think AI may very well destroy us, yeah. but I love it. Yeah. I absolutely adore it. The idea that there is AI today designing antibiotics that can kill superbugs that yeah. human minds cannot design an antibiotic against. That's brilliant. That's a triumph of, 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 of the human spirit. But not to see that we have in exponential concentrations mm-hmm. of uh, incomes in the hands of people who produce nothing except for the right and the opportunity to extract incomes from others, while the world is going to the rocks uh, in terms of the climate catastrophe, that we need to recognize if we're going to remain hopeful. I mean, 
you are a big study of a uh, study of history um, and you <laughs> in try. your books <laughs> talk a lot about technology um, especially when it comes to capital and you would look at most forms of technology and see them as levers to human potential. You know, the, the loom obviously had big threatening impacts on, on the Luddites, hence their um, fight uh, for fairness. Um, but generally speaking, technology is a lever to allow us to create more wealth. Um, its distribution has not always been fair, but over a long period of time, the trend lines are fairly consistent. Um, and especially since about 1910, global inequality has remained about the same. Um, so what, since uh, 1910? Since around about 1910, 1930, on a global they, scale. They remain the well, same. That is not true. Broadly similar. That is it not. depends on whether you look at the top 0.01% okay, or the anyway, top 0.1%. It depends 1 on percent. what you measure. I'm sorry. But, but, but my, my question is like... A, a I'm afflicted by an economic <laughs> mind who ref, that refuses to, to see things. It's the 2022 um, World Inequality Report. Through rose-tinted glasses. <laughs> it's the 2022 World Inequality Report. Um, and it's looked at things globally. Uh, and obviously, no one lives in a global global world we all live in our own reality um, and to some extent we have to wonder if it's about relative income or whether it's about absolute income um, but at what point in the last few years do you think we switched over to sort of techno feudalism like, is there a defining moment where you think we sort of reached this tipping point well it's between 2008 and today so, okay. you know, it's impossible to it's like saying you know when did you become bold <laughs> which hair did you lose so that you switched from being a person with hair to a bold person yeah. uh, there's no such hair that defines the transition but you, I can tell you that it was around the night when, when I was in my 40s yeah. similarly uh, the switch happened after 2008 yeah. and it happened because of 2008 to a very large extent because the way in which the G7 governments and central banks responded to the great financial catastrophe uh, by a combination of socialism for the bankers, you know, trillions pumped out of our central banks to go to the financial sector with huge austerity for everybody else. That um, starved, so you, you know, you create a lot of money, you have liquidity that we never had in the history of the world, which uh, never went into investment because of low levels of demand. So the companies that got this money from the central banks bought back their own shares that created asset price inflation. The only ones who invested were the cloud elites, the people who own cloud capital, you know, the techno feudal lords. Uh, and, you know, wonderful machinery and all that. But that investment went into creating the cloud capital, which then replaced markets with platforms mm -hmm. and shifted... Um, a very significant percentage of the circular flow of income mm -hmm. from profits to rents. Yeah. And that is destabilizing for the global system. What do you think the relationship between the rise of these tech companies and zero interest rates almost has it's a, been? It's what I said. Yeah. I mean, zero interest rates is what happens when you're trying to refloat the financial sector by mm -hmm. printing huge quantities of money, right? I mean, it's, the price of money is uh, related to its uh, supply. So when you boost supply uh, as if there's no tomorrow, then the price of money, which is the rate of interest, will go to zero and below zero, mm -hmm. which is what happened. It's just interesting. When you try and find the sort of defining feature of what a tech company is versus what a tech company isn't, you can look at many things like network effects. You can look at the use of data. Um, but one sort of interesting element, I guess, is to look at capital return and the degree to which they need yeah, to I think that's profit. all irrelevant. That is just mumbo jumbo, just <laughs> trying to sound as if you're financially intelligent. I'm sorry. But, you know, they, I'm intelligent about technology. Yeah, yeah, I'm sure. I'm sure. But from a socioeconomic point of view, yeah. what really matters is none of that. I don't care how you define a tech company. Okay. Right. Um, you can have a tech company that makes fantastic industrial robots. That's not cloud capital. Okay. Right. It's beautiful. I love it. You know, whenever I see an industrial robot, yeah. assemble cars and microchips, it's beautiful. It's, it's like poetry in motion. A lever right? to our bodies. Now, that's a tech company. Yeah. It's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about companies that are investing in the creation of what my definition of cloud capital, which is a produced means of behavioral modification. The difference between an industrial robot, fantastic, technologically snazzy and so on, mm -hmm. And Amazon, or uh, uh, for that matter, Facebook, hmm? yeah. is that the latter is a, not a produced means of production. It is a produced means of behavioral modification. Okay. So that cloud capital gives the owner 
an immense, exorbitant power and privilege to alter people's behavior in order to create, you know, alternatives to markets mm -hmm. in which we are all caught up uh, as buyers and sellers, mm -hmm. but not within a market in which we can choose our partners and choose the algorithms does the choice for us. And the algorithm chooses in a manner that maximizes cloud rents of the owners of that cloud capital. And you're sort of concerned that this becomes somewhat monopolistic because of the information they have on us making it hard to leave that ecosystem or because of their market share or because that's impossible for other people to enter the market or this isn't a sort of monopoly concern? Well, you see, I avoid the word monopoly. Okay. And I avoid it because a monopoly is a market. Mm -hmm. It's a monopolized market. My point about um, Alibaba, so as not to talk only about yeah. you know, Amazon, is that it is not a market. You see, and I try to explain this in the book, uh, imagine you and I are you know, entering a town in the United States of America, you yeah. know, back in the 19th century, let's make it a bit, you know, of, <laughs> a, very of, of a Western movie, yeah. right? Okay. And we discover that every shop in the town belongs to one man. You've, you've seen Westerns like that, right? And there's be, a showdown. It would be more that one person owns the land. No, no, no. Suppose that this person owns the bar, the saloon, the, 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 you know, the, the shops, the, the hotel, everything, everything. Yeah. Every, the post office, uh, the sheriff. Yeah. <laughs> okay? You've seen these movies with John Wayne and so on. Yeah. Right. Now, that's a, a monopolized market, yeah. a monopolized town. You and I walk down the, the store. We know it belongs to that one person who owns everything. Yeah. He has immense monopoly power over everyone in that town. But, but in, again, in Alibaba, for example, 100% of their revenue wait, is from wait, third wait, parties. Wait, 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 you're, 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 you're missing the point of my okay. allegory here. Okay. I have a Western movie <laughs> allegory. Let's not lose it, okay. right? Yeah. The point I'm trying to make is that this is a monopolized market, right? But Alibaba and Amazon are not because in that town, in the Western movie, you and I, Tom, we're walking down the street, right? Yeah. And we look at the shop window. You and I see the same thing. We may not buy it, we may say, you know, let's not give our money to this terrible man yeah. who owns everything, right? But we converse, we see the same thing. If you and I had our laptops here and we went to Alibaba or uh, Amazon and we typed extravagant binoculars, huh? you see different things to what I'm going to see. Yeah. The algorithm knows you, knows me, and calibrates what we see, and it does not select the same thing. So we don't even see the same things. Yeah. That's not a marketplace. It's not a monopolized market. It is not a market. It is an algorithm, like a Soviet economic system, yeah. which decides who does what, with whom, without any consultation, without any way that you and I can communicate as buyers, or you as a seller and me as a buyer. No way that we can communicate unless the algorithm chooses for us to communicate. I mean, some people that's would call that personalization. Some no, no, people no, no, call that's that all rubbish. Relevance. It is not a market. You can call it whatever. You can call it uh, Snoopy Doo. Yeah. It is not a, the point I'm making is not a market. Yeah. Right? And it is an algorithm mm -hmm. which matches the people who are selling with the people who are buying in the interests, yeah. not of the seller even, that would be monopoly, mm -hmm. but of the rentier or the landlord of that cloud capital. Mm -hmm. That's the point I'm making. Okay, okay. I mean, what do you think is the solution to all this? How are things going to progress from here? Can technology be the fix as well as the problem? Technology has never been the fix to the problems we create with the technology. Mm -hmm. The problem is political. It's social. Um, so, you know, steam engines were not responsible for the awful conditions of the working class in Manchester mm -hmm. uh, when the first dark satanic mills were put together. Right? Uh, and the solution was not technology. The solution was um, you know, social, political um, interventions. That will always be the case. So I don't blame the technology. And therefore, I do not expect the, the technology to solve the problem. The question is, who owns what? Yeah. You see, some people are very worried about um, surveillance. Mm -hmm. That you know, these companies know so much about us. I'm not that bothered, personally. I mean, I understand why people are worried. Yeah. Um, I'm slightly worried, yeah. but I'm far more worried by what they own. Okay. And they own this capital, which is a capacity to separate us, to fragment us as markets, mm -hmm. as communities, as societies. 
uh, to influence us in ways we don't understand, in ways that the people who wrote the algorithms do not understand. Yeah. This is even That's more true. worrying, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you hear that from yeah. coders, from AI, I and so on. More true. Like AI is a good example yeah. where yeah. people are surprised. So for me, for me, as an old lefty, yeah. the answer must always be the socialization of the means of production. In some ways, technology has been a force to kind of democratize access to wealth creation. So now it's... You live in a different universe, <laughs> mate. Uh, there are, are plenty of 15 Democratization. Or what democratization? Uh, we have exactly the opposite. We live in a world where three companies, yeah. BlackRock, State Street and Vanguard, yeah. own 90% of all the companies in the New York Stock Exchange, and you're talking about democratization. They don't own 90%. They all have um, a majority shareholding together yeah, right, 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 in 90%. Yeah, 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 again, oh. nitpicking. <laughs> yeah, this is, this is yeah. you know, Adam Smith is the patron saint yes. of the free market. Yeah. He would be aghast hearing you talk about the you know democratization of, of capitalism. For him, what we now have would be a nightmare. But, but you could argue that a platform like Shopify makes it easy for people without much many means to, to set up a store. You could argue that uh, YouTube gives an opportunity for anyone in the world to make a world-class documentary and they can make money from advertising. You could argue that Facebook um, has democratized access to advertising tools that allow people to buy media at the same rate as bigger companies. Like I'm aligned with almost all of your thinking. Um, I just think it's a little bit unfair to look at some of the dynamics that provide access to people in a more level way. Um, and to some extent, the data that allows a marketplace to personalize what they offer um, actually works in favor, in, in some cases, of, of sort of smaller companies that use these. That last sentence yeah. is absurd. <laughs> Everything else you said before was fine. The conclusion well, well, was absolutely yeah. absurd. You will allow me to say, right? Yeah, now, yeah. listen, there is no doubt then, yeah. Amazon gave, uh, gives every day yeah. fantastic opportunities to producers yeah. uh, to reach customers. Yeah. There's no doubt about that. Shopify yeah. does the same thing. Um, all these, not, not this is ancient, but you know, <laughs> all the paraphernalia of podcasting and so on allows all of us to be broadcasters. Yeah. Okay? That is all That's perfectly okay. true. Yeah. And it's great. Yeah. It's great. However, the point I'm making is that the techno-feudal forces at work, which are based on the manner in which cloud capital operates, yeah. are ensuring that all those people who work, who you know, create businesses and sell stuff through Amazon or Shopify and so on, yeah. in the end become vassals. Yeah. Because you know, landlords under feudalism did allow people to actually do things. They yeah. gave them land, they gave them the opportunity to produce stuff. They, they were called vassals in the sense that they were completely dependent on the landlord who actually grabbed rent out of them until he squeezed the living wits out of them. Mm -hmm. This is precisely what we're having. We're having um, machinery and cloud capital that allows us to do a lot of stuff, right? Podcasts and so on. And yet, if you look at the concentration of the capacity to influence public opinion, yes. we've never had less of a free press than we have today yes. with, within the context yes. of each one of us being able to be a small BBC or Euronews or whatever. I guess when I hear a lot of what you say, the, the sentiment that you have is something that I agree with entirely. Um, I, I'm personally by no means a fan of, of Amazon or any of these tech giants, and I, I hate the level of um, influence they have over our lives. But I think of it more in terms of algorithmic persuasion. I think of it more in terms of um, slightly sociopathic tendencies to monetize our attention in ways that leads us to be uh, more angry with each other than we should be. So I wonder sometimes if maybe um, the real brunt of your concern is, is, is not more about algorithms and the way that they're used. Um, I, do, I love algorithms. The question is, who yeah. owns the bloody thing? Yeah. Right? Okay. If one person owns an algorithm that controls billions of people, then we have something worse than 1984. Yeah. We're shifting towards a brave new world. There's sort of where, opening up access to algorithms. Where, to you see, 1984 was a problem of surveillance. Yeah. yeah. Uh, brave new world is a problem where we are all happy little slaves who love our s slavery. Yeah. Right? And yeah. that is a problem. Yeah. If you are a liberal, if you are, if you believe in freedom, if you believe, it. but also there is something else Tom, that really worries me. Um, you talked about algorithms that um, are primed yes. 
to maximize rage yeah. and outrage it's, it's, it's and it's and intolerance. Yeah. We all know that, right? You only need to to, to go on X, formerly Twitter, <laughs> to five five yes. minutes of that. Yes. Like some who said that? I think it was Stephen Fry said something brilliant. He, he said this quite a long time ago before Musk. Uh, it's a bit like um, taking everything which is written on the walls of male toilets around the world and posting it online. Yes. So yeah, yes. I agree with you. But think of this. If my macroeconomic analysis in the book is right, yeah. we have a situation where, as David Ricardo in 1809 warned us, mm -hmm. if uh, you have an um, economic system where increasing percentages of income mm -hmm. are siphoned off the cycle of investment by rentiers, mm -hmm. he was talking about the corn laws back then, due to the Napoleonic Wars, that, you know, um, the war in Europe then, the Napoleonic Wars, uh, were a boon to landlords because they didn't have to compete with imported corn, and therefore they managed to charge higher and higher rents on the producers of corn who used their land, but because they just simply got rich in their sleep, mm -hmm. because it was rent, it was not capitalist profit, uh, the, it was as if this money this economic energy was taken out of the circular flow, mm -hmm. there was less investment, and the whole system was be becoming degenerate. So I'm telling a similar story. If increasing quantities of economic energy are being siphoned off as rents by the owners of those cloud thieves, uh, mm -hmm. these platforms, then that explains to a very large extent why we have inflation. Central banks continue to print money. Why? even though you have inflation? Well, because aggregate demand is shrinking as a result of the fact that a lot of wealth is being siphoned off the circular flow of income in the form of cloud rents. So you have inflation, you have bullshit jobs, as David Graeber scientifically put it, yeah. right? You have discontent building up mm -hmm. with our central banks, with our governments, with markets, with inflation, and then you have those algorithms that make a lot more money mm -hmm. out of priming the outrage. Mm -hmm. And then the more they prime the outrage, the more they extract money from the circular flow of income, and the more outrage there is. That spins out of control. And what becomes the end point for this? So like a global the end of, uh, of civilization. Okay. This is, this, you know, this is not going to be good. Mm -hmm. I don't think anything good is going to come out of it. I don't believe, I'm not one of those left-wing revolutionists who think, like Lenin once said, that the worse things get, the better it is. I don't believe that. I've seen in this country, in Greece, I've seen the deterioration of living standards year after year after year, and that only produces Nazis, nothing good. Um, and when you look towards a tool like AI, can you see that as being something to bring us out of that spiral or, or something to... No technology will bring us out. I mean, in a good society, we will be using AI all the time. Mm -hmm. All the time. <laughs> we, don't, we no longer need, for instance, you know, teachers training us to do things. Mm -hmm. We need teachers to educate us. But the training can be subcontracted to AI beautifully already, it can be. Right? So I love it. Mm -hmm. But it will not solve the problem of you know, the cloudalists, as I call them, exorbitant power of the rest of society. If anything, it will make it worse because AI makes the algorithms faster and better. How, how do you sort of reconcile in your mind um, the sort of cloud owners with forces for absolute evil versus companies that have elements to what they do? Uh, which is beneficial to society. You know, one could look at YouTube and see how that could educate people across the world who otherwise wouldn't have access to books. Like, like, is it possible in your head to sort of reconcile what's a good use of server-based technology course. and what's bad? Of course, absolutely. There are a lot of fantastic and, you know, fully humanist mm -hmm. uses of technology today. Uh, the question is, where is humanity as a whole being led mm -hmm by the more powerful forces at work within it. That, that is the question. And uh, we have to constantly be on the lookout mm -hmm. for good uses of technology, which are all over us, uh, for ideas of how society should be functioning, designed, what is ar its ar architecture should be. 
And how do you see these conversations progressing in the context of, you know, global climate change and moves towards net zero? I mean, do you think of that as being, again, a sort of a catalyst to bring the end closer? Um, do you think of it as an environment which changes people's motivations away from consumption in a way that helps decelerate this change? I'm afraid not. I see the opposite. Okay. Because in the same way that the algorithms are primed to um, excite intolerance in our souls, mm -hmm. Uh, they are primed to make us buy things that we neither need nor want mm -hmm. and, you know, to, 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 to just to forget about difficult things like <laughs> the climate crisis. Of course, these algorithms are essential in fighting the climate crisis. Yeah. So if, if, if we as a society, as a community, as a League of La Nations or of societies, if we could agree to stop drilling for oil and you know fossil fuels more generally if we agree to end the wars that yeah. would be very helpful <laughs> war doesn't help the climate no. uh, in in the slightest then we would design our new green energy grids and, and you can only design it if you if you have very strong use of fantastic algorithms yeah. that are necessary in order to ensure that the peak load is always uh, used properly that um, you know wind solar and other renewables are combined in the optimal manner yeah. uh, so like like the beginning of time our technologies are a force for good yeah. and for, for a force of evil. And if evil prevails, it is our fault. I think I want you to, to leave on um, some action that we can take. You know, like, like um, I love what you say make it, makes it me feel like we're at this sort of liminal point. Okay, I will. I will, I will work I, out well or badly. What, what can we do to ensure that we get to a better place together? Well, I think that we, we should concentrate on two things. Mm -hmm. Firstly, we must end free services. Mm -hmm. Because you don't need me to explain that. Uh, when you have free services, effectively, you've got the complete uh, tyranny of uh, the cloud capitalists or the cloudalists. It would be uh, fantastic if we had subscript micropayments, a micropayment system. And yeah. if some people can't afford it, they should get social security payments in order to make for these micropayments. Yeah. So you're creating an app, okay. right? You get paid directly by the person who is using the app, yeah. not indirectly through advertising, because that way you do not have this... Uh, uh, complete takeover of our souls. Yeah. Okay. Uh, that's one thing. The second thing is fantastic if we started thinking in terms of uh, changing corporate law. Imagine, just, just imagine, I know it sounds like <laughs> science fiction, but technically it's really very simple. Imagine that uh, you and I, if we were to form a, a company or 30 of us, 40 of us, we form a cooperative mm -hmm. and we have one share each. Imagine if every company, especially large companies, uh, had a share structure whereby every employee had one share which could not, could not be traded. Mm -hmm. In the same way as a university student gets um, a library card mm -hmm. or a student union card mm -hmm. when they enroll, and then they have to hand it over or it becomes invalid when they leave, when they graduate. Mm -hmm. They cannot sell it, they cannot buy it, but they can use it to vote. They can use it to take books out. They can use it to use the, 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 the internet, the internet and so on. Mm -hmm. hmm? Imagine if that's how shares were and they okay. gave you one vote in the company and you, and you worked. Yeah. didn't mean equality yeah. because we could vote. But the person who actually creates the really good stuff which allows us, our company to do well, yeah. we should give more money to him or her. Okay. Right? So imagine that. Yeah, yeah. That would be a magnificent revolution. It would end share markets and labor markets mm -hmm. in one go. And then you would have no state, you had market-based cooperatives mm -hmm. owning the algorithm but in a way that is not predatory. And if they had to receive micropayments from those who actually use them, the, the algorithms, then we would be talking about technology in the interests of a combination of freedom and justice. Okay. So something kind of rooted in the philosophy almost as like a DAO or something sort of based on blockchain or does the technology not matter? It's all about the sort of... It, the technology doesn't matter. Yeah. Uh, so what I described, you could do it with pieces of paper, yeah. really. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it helps to have um, yeah. an algorithm. Um, blockchain might be useful, but you know the, the problem with blockchain is that it has become a religion. Yeah. And you know you have people who religiously hate it, 
Yeah. And people who religiously adopt it, and I'm I'm just not a religious person yeah. when when it comes to these things. I think you know yeah. horses for courses. The blockchains can be very useful. I mean, yeah. J.P. Morgan uses it internally. Yeah. If they use it internally, we should use it internally too. But we must not think that blockchain is the answer. Yeah. Blockchain is a tool. That makes sense. So when it does come to your world, this prediction. Um, in some ways, you're you're thinking that perhaps this could be the start of the downfall of civilization, um, or you're also open-minded to there being Indeed. other ways. I forward. maintain hope. Hope is my duty, and I cling on to it against all empirical evidence. <laughs> that makes absolute sense. Uh, Yanis Varoflakis, thanks very much Thank for coming you, Tom. on the show. Thank you. Very good. Very good for time. Cool. What a, that, 